Um, I'd just like to acknowledge as well our partners. We've got Royal Life Saving Society Australia, Commercial Aquatics Australia, OTM Planning Group, YMCA Victoria, Victoria State Government Health and Human Services Department, Belgravia Leisure, Cleaning Melbourne, VACA, Align Leisure, our Watch Around Water Accredited Facilities, EcoSave, and Western Leisure Services. Uh, as I as I said earlier, that Bruce, the presenter, uh, is our presenter today. So Bruce's topic is restart your business lessons from greenfields. Um, and Bruce is a, uh, a consultant or a senior consultant at OTM Planning Group. Um, so a, a little bit of background about Bruce. So Bruce uh, has quite a bit of experience in setting up what we call greenfield sites. So Bruce set up the not just the the, the facility, but the, the entire concept and operating. Uh, model for Peninsula Aquatic and Leisure, um, Peninsula Aquatic and Recreation Center, apologies, and Western Leisure Services, which is the uh, otherwise known as the local government enterprise model. Um, and Bruce sort of conceived that model and, and oversaw those oversaw those two uh, greenfield developments. And previous to that, Bruce uh, worked for the city of Monash, overseeing the leisure branch as well as the city of Yarra prior to that. So quite a bit of experience um, operating uh, local government enterprises and in a local government uh, leisure capacity as well. Um, so probably without uh, without any sort of further um, ado, I might hand over to you, Bruce, and um, welcome. Thank you for coming on the uh, the webinar series today, and uh, we'll we'll move through your presentation. Thanks very much, RJ. Um, pleasure to to be here. Um, could I get you just to move on to the the next? Uh, slide for me. Can you see that one, Bruce? We've got your overview. I, I here. can, yeah, and yeah, thank you. Yeah, that that one. You just stop there. Thank, thanks very much, RJ, and uh, and thanks for the introduction too. You've actually saved probably me a few minutes of um, introducing my, myself uh, in a moment's time. Just a, a, in terms of a, an overview, and, and congratulations to um, Royal Life Saving Society uh, Australia and, and Fitness Australia for putting the, the PD series together. Um, it's a great way to support the industry, um, easy, uh, affordable, and you know certainly accessible. Um, so this is a, an overview of, of what I'll be covering today. Um, in my learnings from establishing, establishing um, um, greenfield sites over the last uh, you know, six, seven, eight years, both personal learnings and, and professional learnings, certainly a lot of professional learnings, but um, some personal uh, moments of reflection along the way as well. Um, planning in terms of what we did in um, setting up frameworks for planning to open these uh, these greenfield sites. And I'll also touch on the, the implications of the, the current climate that we're in. It's been a challenging presentation to put together because, uh, you know, I think we, we spoke about this perhaps three weeks ago and uh, a lot has changed in three weeks. It's a rapidly changing environment and even in the last few days trying to keep up with the um, amount of, of data and information that's that's being posted and, and coming um, out, uh, trying to keep the presentation up to date was, has been challenging. Uh, so I, I've done my best. Um, next, next slide, please, RJ. Is that coming through there, Bruce? We've got a picture of a bunch of facilities. Uh, there it is. It's just come through. It's just taken a, a, a little while, but I've, I've got it now. Yeah, thanks. Um, so look, this touches, RJ's covered a little bit about um, my, myself for those who I, I haven't met. Um, I have had a career in the industry um, commencing um, some time ago um, as a swimming instructor, lifeguard, duty manager, gym instructor, um, um, swim school coordinator, centre manager, manager of um, within local government of of a, a branch of facilities, and more recently um, establishing um, as the inaugural CEO of of two local government business entities. Um, and so that's a startup of the company, um, starting from scratch, and also starting up uh, regional aquatic centres, uh, regional multi sport stadium and uh, multi multi-purpose aquatic centers so predominantly in in the, in the area of what what i would call a big box leisure center um, so what i'm 
will do um, today is is present my learnings from the startup phase of of the companies and um, and the greenfield sites as well. Thanks, RJ. Onto the onto the next slide, please. It's a bit slow for, for some reason here, but personal reflections here. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jay. And look, I'm, I'm happy just to wait for the pause as long as it, it keeps coming through. Um, we understand there's a, a slight pause. Um, that's that's all understood. Um, thank you. So uh, this is a metaphor for, for what it felt like um, for me going through a greenfield um, startup. Um, this is a, a real event, believe it or not. Uh, don't do it now, but you can YouTube um, this clip for a few YouTube something like crazy man jumps from hot air balloon you will you will find it I don't know the name of it exactly but um, creating a, a startup and and um, getting ready for a greenfield opening um, felt a little bit like this at times uh, jumping out of a of a plane or, or a hot air balloon in this case with with no parachute and learning on the way down and needing to learn on the way down what it um, uh, what it what was required to put the parachute on uh, learn how to operate the parachute and uh, where, where to land uh, where the target was to land um, the ground feels like it's approaching at a rate of knots uh, you know the sense is going to reopen uh, well in my case it was going to open and in, in this case it's going to reopen that date once we know it will be um, firm and there's a lot of things to organize um, and you need to figure them out sooner rather than later. I have heard uh, another um, industry colleague uh, speak of and use that exact same metaphor in terms of learning how to, to put a parachute on on the way down. Um, some days I felt like I was in control and had the parachute on and uh, knew what was happening and other days I felt quite naked with, without it and um, you know the ups and downs of of going through um, a startup were tumultuous. I had other staff describe it to me as a as a roller coaster. Um, and what I found important, and I'll touch on this in in a moment, is um, having a a sense of of control and having a plan with um, a target within that plan, so that I I could um, focus on what needed to be done, how it needed to be done, and and, and where that target was. Um, next. Slide, please, RJ. Thank you. Um, so this is what a, a bad day looked like if I felt like I'd, I'd lost my parachute or didn't have it on. And, and, and some, some may say that this is what a normal day to them looks like anyway, <laughs> regardless of whether we're in COVID or, or, or a, a business as usual day of operations, there are a lot of competing priorities to balance. And in a, a, a greenfield or in, in, in a startup situation, the, the, the loss of control um, or, or the absence of, of certainty um, magnifies these competing priorities. And, um, you know, knowledge is power. And at the moment, we don't have all the knowledge and we don't have all the power as to when will the reopening be, how can we plan, what data are we working towards. All we know is there's a whole lot of competing priorities to uh, balance and trying to put them, trying to make sense of all of these different um, components and putting them into a, a framework to plan was very important. Otherwise, you will flip from one circle to the other circle every day without knowing where the urgency is, where the priority is, and um, it's difficult to manage a, a team who are all trying to work towards a single goal if your plan looks something like that. Um, so what we did is, and I'll present that in, in a minute as well, is put a, a framework together uh, to make sense of all the different componentries uh, within a startup and within a greenfield, and in this instance, reopening your business so you can make sense of it. And just, you know, in terms of another reflection, uh, a personal reflection is that there, there were certainly days where um, the planning uh, was out of control and, and just maintaining an awareness of your own mental health along the journey 
Um, and when you are out of your depth or you feel like you're out of the depth, having a network of people you can speak to, um, reaching out, asking others in the in the industry what they're doing, how they're going. You don't have to have all the answers. Not everyone will have all the answers, but someone will be able to help you. So um, whether that person is within your team or not within your team, just um, be be aware of that along the way because you will have moments. And in fact, you know some some people may already have had them where um, you feel like you've lost your parachute or you don't have it on. Next slide, thanks, RJ. So there are some um, similar similarities between uh, what's happening with with COVID and and the greenfield in terms of uh, the reopening um, uh, comparison. So, but both have both events have uncertain um, um, trading dates where 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 trading will recommence or in the start of a um, in the in the um, uh, example of a greenfield, uh, the date that the that trading will commence. Now that date is in a greenfield. You will get a construction schedule, and uh, the 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 asset owner will will tell you, and the builders will tell you this is the date of of building handover. Um, Ninety nine point nine times out of a hundred, that date actually changes. So having a framework. It's, it's quite rare for a, a building to be delivered on, on time. Usually it's, it's you know, at late, whether that's days or, or weeks or months is dependent on a number of matters. But the uncertainty of having a unknown date of handover is similar in some, in some, in some way to what will the date of, of reopening be um, after COVID. The, clearly the other difference for for the current situation is we don't know what the reopening will look like. Um, we don't know what the physical distancing um, restrictions will be. We have an idea um, and there are certainly a lot of uh, frameworks and guidelines that industry bodies have, have released already about what that might look like. Um, but until the government confirm that, we, we don't truly know. Um, and the time frame is much shorter at the moment. Um, you know, there could be some form of um, easing of restrictions uh, in Northern Territory has already started um, and other, other states and the federal government might, might soon follow. Um, so having a, a framework that is movable where you can pick up a schedule and if, if day zero is the day of trading, then working backwards, what happens on, on, day, on day one, what happens on day two prior to opening and working your way through a schedule so that you've got a day by day plan of what needs to happen and you can, excuse me, you can manage that plan and work backwards and move it when need be. Just move on to the next slide, please, RJ. So um, just linked to that, that previous slide, you'll see this, this slide is um, a framework. Now you can use any framework but it, it, it essentially has what are the activities and tasks, who is responsible, what are the deadlines, and, and the governance processes. Well, this is the governance process. It's a framework of managing all of those competing priorities and putting them into a, a, a document that you can circulate and use as a tool to manage yourself, to manage your team, to manage uh, upwards and 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 downwards in terms of information that is um, that is aligned in purpose. Um, and this 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 can be modified and it can be treated and it should be treated as a live document and adjusted daily along the way. Um, and in in some 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 people will already have started um, planning for this and some people will be well um, versed in in using documents like this and, and, and others perhaps not so. I think of um, a, a contractor um, uh, organisation or organisations that, that go through startups regularly or, or transitioning into new centres. Um, they have very well established and, and detailed transition, transition in plans. They know what they're doing, they know who's doing it, they know when it needs to be done. Um, but I'm also very conscious that out there at the moment, there will be a lot of um, managers and people responsible for um, 
centres, uh, whether they be big box or small box centres, who haven't been through a startup and uh, perhaps don't have a an existing framework to to build from. So this this simply um, lists the 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 functional areas, whether that be communications or human resources or operations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you can see in in this example there were over 200 in a greenfield startup. We had over 200 tasks, uh, well well over 200 tasks that that needed to be done. And it simply puts a start and a finish date against each task, who is responsible and the percent complete. And the beauty of this framework, I have seen it in a project management as a Gantt chart, uh, quite complicated. Uh, and if you know how to use project management, by all means that can be used. We, we were using a simple Excel spreadsheet and um, we were updating the percent complete column as time moved on so we can see which task um, was was where, and we could also um, keep track of the interdependencies between tasks because some need to get done before another one can get started. Um, from a management point of view, it's a good tool because it gives you a very visual guide to look at to understand um, where, where are we at in terms of percent complete. So reporting timelines to your manager um, and reporting to your team as to where are the hot spots? Where, where are the, you know, those those percent completes that should be closer to 100 that might only be at 10 or 20 percent? Where are the risks? And um, it's a very good snapshot document to um, use as a reporting tool. Um, and it also brings staff together uh, if used um, uh, as an engagement tool with your leadership team or with, with which, whichever team you want to bring into the reopening process. Um, having staff um, um, contribute to the to the framework in terms of what needs to be done, they know their areas as as well as anyone or better than anyone. Um, so they will know what tasks need to get done, and they should be engaged to um, contribute to the to the planning. Next, um, yeah, thanks, thanks, RJ. Um, so you know, in ter in terms of the, the planning, I, I'm reminded of um, a um, sign that was in my geography room in, in year nine, and, and I'm sure many of you have heard it already more, but it was, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Um, and it's one thing that stuck in my mind from, from high school, perhaps not much did, but that, that one certainly did. Uh, so you, you really do need to have a plan, and it, it can be as simple as the one that I've just presented, Starting with functional areas, it doesn't have to be overcomplicated. The more you overcomplicate it, the harder it will be to manage it. Um, it's going to have mistakes in it, and you will have oversights. It doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to exist in some form or another. Um, and you can use it to, to collaborate with your team, bring them into the process, and meet with them regularly. Uh, in the Greenfield startups, we were meeting <clears throat> excuse me, weekly, and we were modifying that plan and we were going around, a, you know, a round circle kind of table discussion and describing what tasks were complete, where were the holdups, and we understood where were the pinch points, where were the risks, and it really does um, galvanise a team together to um, deliver the, the ultimate outcome, which is to um, get, get reopened. It was constantly modified. We constantly deleted lines that we thought were tasks we needed to do, but we didn't. And we were constantly adding in new tasks. It's a live document and it, it's, a, it's a framework. One of the exercises we, we did was, it might be more challenging, although I'm sure you could figure out a way to do it in the current um, you know, physical distancing environment, was a, a sticky note exercise where in a in a room, it could be a virtual room. We had each staff member or each you know team member um, list out randomly all the things that they needed to get done to reopen on a on a yellow sticky note, and uh, we had we had hundreds of sticky notes. And then what we did is we themed them. We we gathered them all together, and on a wall we had uh, human resources, information technology, budget, operations, rosters, whatever it may be. And then we grabbed the yellow sticky notes and we stuck them all under the themes. And then all of a sudden you've got, 
your 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 transition plan or your establishment plan. It's going to need review and refinement. That the bulk of the data that needed to be themed under those functional areas was already in everyone's mind. It was just getting it together in one single um, coordinated framework that um, you know really brought that team together. Next slide, please, RJ. Thank you. It sounds like you're uh, referencing a Kanbanchi board where you've got the do, doing done or to do doing done in that sort of uh, that sort of format. There's there's a couple of good virtual options for that and and Microsoft Teams and those types of platforms as well. No, no doubt, no, no doubt. There, there's a you know that that's a a physical room with physical sticky notes. You could do that virtually comfortably over Teams and and there are there are bound to be pieces of software that if you wanted to you could use, but I, I just don't think you would you you would need to do it. One of the um, elements in the current environment, well, and also in a greenfield, is you need to move with speed. Um, you need to know what you're doing, but you you need to move quickly. And and the ground under you is is a little uncertain at times. You need to make a decision. Uh, you might get it wrong, but you need to make a decision and get on with it um, and and adjust along the way rather than to um, sit on your fingers and, and, and not get anything done. So le learnings from the past, I'll, I'll, I'll go through these and I'll, I'll defer a couple um, just to later on in the presentation. There's a couple of slides that we'll pick up on, on budget and, and strategic plans a, a little more. But learnings along the learnings from the past for me, um, and I've tried to group these into some, some functional areas, um, plant and equipment testing is is paramount, and I've I've already seen lots of data on on LinkedIn, and I know there's um, some suppliers, and I know many centres are, are, are completely aware of this. But Murphy's law tells you that something will go wrong when you reopen. Something won't work. Something won't restart. Um, in in a greenfield site, um, you're, you're lucky. Most plant and equipment is new. It will be commissioned um, by the in, installers or manufacturers before they hand over. So you know it's going to work um, in, in the reopening phase. Make sure that you're testing um, and have tested your plant and equipment uh, well well before uh, you're, you're ready to recommence training. For rosters, uh, rostering took a long time. So depending on, on when the restrictions are eased and what, and what a reopening looks like, this may not be such a big deal, um, but it may be if you have lost, lost staff now or stood down staff, um, there there is a, a risk in my mind that some some might not come back. Um, hopefully not, but that 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 risk remains nonetheless. Um, so allowing enough time, and and you all know you know how long it takes to recruit, uh, train, and induct um, um, new staff. So allowing enough time and factoring that into your plan. And if you think about that framework, the start date and the finish date, um, having enough bodies to fill into your roster and understanding where your rostering gaps are. For those that have a learn to swim component in their um, operations or in, in their, in their um, centre um, for um, the greenfield startup, matching a changing demand to the supply of swimming instructors was quite challenging. Um, and if I relate that to the current environment, you know, when the swim school reopens, uh, understanding whether children have um, regressed in their skill or whether they the numbers return as they did will be a, a jigsaw puzzle that most swim coordinators are dealing with uh, every day anyway. Um, but juggling where the demand is to how many instructors are available will, will take time and um, you make sure you put that time into your, into your planning. Budgeting is uh, difficult at the, the best of times. Um, what that looks like after a period of, of closure um, remains to be seen and, and will be quite challenging. I'm going to touch on the budget a little bit more um, in, in a moment. So, um, you know, just, just being aware of uh, rephasing the budget um, and modelling several scenarios, not developing an optimistic base case um, in, in uncertain times, and, and what level of assumption in terms of business decrease will, will you assume when you're putting um, your, your, your revenue lines through a line-by-line -line review? Um, it's a question that I'm getting asked 
commonly. Um, and I, I am hearing people making assumptions from 15% to 20% to 30%. I don't know that there's a correct answer for it. I did see a survey come out yesterday, I think, from Fitness Australia, indicating that 85% of users intend to, to return to their um, fitness centre, which indicates that 15% um, perhaps don't uh, look, look likely to return. So there's a 15% decrease, perhaps. Um, in terms of your, your strategic plan, I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a moment. But, the, you know, setting a, a strategic plan for a greenfield site was really important. Having a vision in place, knowing where the objectives were and what the strategies were, what, what is the goal, where, where are we um, uh, delivering, um, you know, in what, in what segments of the market are we delivering that goal. So what impact COVID has on strategic plans, I'll, I'll touch on in a minute. And emergency evacuation, training and testing. Um, you know, testing your EWIS systems, um, your emergency evacuation systems, different from plant and equipment, particularly your e EWIS systems, training the staff, retraining the staff, conducting pra practice evacuations and restarting up the whole centre, making sure that you are you are set up to, um, you know, safely evacuate if, if need be. Next slide, please, RJ. Okay, so the current environment will have an impact on business plans, no doubt, and, and no doubt many, many staff are already being asked to review and realign their budgets and perhaps, you know, for those that, that need to, their balance sheet and, and cash flow as well. Um, uh, if, if the strategy changes or the business plan changes, then that needs to be aligned to the budget. Um, it needs to be aligned to the KPIs and your employee targets. Creating a sound business plan takes a lot of time and takes a lot of thinking. Um, so I'm just conscious that whilst that is an action that needs to be aligned and reviewed, perhaps it's something that, that you postpone until you have reopened and got through this, this hump of um, you know, high workload and have time to really then review what's happening in the business plan. You might do the two concurrently to a degree to start with, um, but the business plan will certainly need a, a bit of thinking um, as, as we come through this. Marketing and collaterals in, in a greenfield site, these are incredibly important, setting your brand, um, you know, your colour palette, what are, what are your services, what are your products, um, establishing essentially everything from scratch, websites, marketing material. Most sites and most centres will probably have marketing and collaterals. The reason I've included it on this in for this presentation is just consider your um, supply chain and any possible supply chain interruptions um, that might have impact on lead times. Uh, so whether that be the, the content, if you've got a graphic um, uh, artist or graphic designer, or whether you've got printers, if it's hard copy, um, you know, are they still in business? Are they still able to meet your timelines if you need to get any marketing or collaterals out? Uh, welcome back events, uh, particularly for, for members, uh, treating the members um, with a sense of priority. Uh, for a Greenfield, we conducted a number of welcome events for members for two reasons. One, it, it, it gives them priority access and um, helped make them feel special. And it also helped us test the building um, and test that the gym equipment worked and the lockers worked and the showers were warm enough. So when you're restarting your business, <clears throat> excuse me, just contemplate perhaps having a, a welcome back event for the, the members, making sure you've got enough sta staff on hand to um, um, deal with any concerns, deal with any inquiries, get feedback from the members. The point of the events is to get feedback and understand what's not working and what's working really well before you open your doors um, to recommence training on in a, on a full scale, and the same applies for the test events um, in a in a big box leisure centre. De depending on how the restrictions are eased, whether it's just the gym componentry first, or whether it's the gym and the pool, um, you know, there's, there's a few variables to work out there. But having some test events where you're using the aquatic playground 
you are having children go down the water slides, um, you're having people use the showers, the change rooms, the vending machines, and having feedback mechanisms in place just to make sure that everything has um, re rebooted and, and restarted the way you wanted it to, and getting feedback from a test event, but again, just before you open in a larger scale. Um, so, so it sounds a bit like you're you know, advocating for the benefit of soft launches and yeah. you know, maybe maybe just to expand on that, if you don't mind me asking a, a question or two here, Bruce, if that's all right. Not at all. Um, Not at all. Is is just, you know, like get you know, maybe maybe a way of implementing that is, you know, get your staff in to, you know, have a have an inflatable test or a you know water slide test or 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 whether it be uh you know bring they bring their families or whatever it is, but there's some there's some level of um uh, you know, a soft launch in, in a sort of semi-controlled environment with a maybe a, a safer audience, um, and then and then it sounds like launching it to your your most loyal customers, which is your member your members next, um, is kind of what you might might be advocating for. Is that is that kind of correct? Spot on, RJ. Absolutely spot on. So um, having a a soft launch or a, or a test event in 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 my mind, exactly the same same thing. Having it with a understanding audience that understands it is a test event, it is a soft launch, and you market it that way um, so that the group that comes in, whether it be your loyal members um, or whether it be um, staff, it could be a staff-only soft soft launch, and we've done that with a couple of Greenfields as well, or staff and family soft launch. Uh, we also did one with the builders um, when when as a thank you to the builders after they'd completed one of the facilities. So it, it is um, having them come in, but letting them know it's a test event so that if something doesn't work, that they're um, pre-warned that it, you know, that might be the case. And just being really open to getting the feedback and having staff on hand, walking around and speaking to, to people to understand their their feedback, what what is working and, at the end of the soft launch or the, the test event, having a, a, a debriefing session with your staff, get together for 15 or 30 minutes at the end of the, the launch and hold a debriefing session with your staff so everyone gets the chance to put forward what they learned from the soft launch and um, what they heard from the attendees um, in terms of what feedback was provided um, Will be invaluable because if you can iron out those little glitches before you you know your your maths reopen, um, you'll be much better off than, than learning um, along the way. Oh, Thank, thanks, Bruce, and, and and guys, if you've got questions for Bruce, he's more than happy to take questions um, throughout and 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 you know drop those into the chat the chat um, function. There's a there's a chat bar, show conversation. Drop a question in there. Bruce is more than happy to take your questions. Um, Bruce, I've got one more, maybe just to touch on marketing. So, sure. so if I think about you know traditional marketing um, for an aquatic center, let's rather than traditional, let's say current. Um, you know, you'd be thinking about you know social media and EDMs and getting getting newsletters out to your members and your swim school participants, that that kind of thing. Um, I imagine there's going to be a lot of noise out there as every single business starts to open up again. Um, do you have any thoughts or have, or have you got any thoughts around, you know, alternative strategies that our industry could take to, to, to get the message out when they're reopening um, to our current clients and to, and to new or prospective clients as well that, that might be a bit out of the box? Have you got anything in that space? Uh, good, good question, RJ. Um, I think what most centres will be relying on at the moment is um, um, tried and tested ways of communicating with their database and I, I know that the industry has moved really quickly to embrace online delivery of, of um, you know digital fitness essentially um, and the comms that have been predominantly the comms that go out to databases is, is usually through as you've stated EDMs, social media, um, uh, electronic means of, of communicating with, with, the, um, with the industry uh, in terms of uh, new ways of communicating, I, I don't think there are particularly new ways of communicating. Um, what I'm seeing from um, the, um, the the government and, and industry bodies is is just um, reinforcing the need of 
um, the importance to keep exercising and to keep moving. And, and most fitness centres are embracing that as well. So I think they'll fall largely um, back to what they know, and that is marketing online, marketing um, direct to the existing database to keep them active and, and considering um, some um, promotional events or even some, some pricing um, strategies to encourage uh, existing clients to come back and to encourage new clients to, to come into the centre. Thanks, Bruce. That's that's great. I'll, so I'll try not to interrupt you again. Apologies. No, no, that's fine. I don't, I'm happy to happy to answer answer questions. I'll um I might just skip down. The, the last dot point on this slide is is more about member acquisition assumptions. So, um, you, you know, when you're putting together a a greenfield site, um, and getting it ready to start up, obviously one of the things you need to do, and one of the hardest things to do, is to put together a budget for year one, not, not having any trading data to work from in the past. So you need to make a number of assumptions based on how many members, how many members in which membership category, how many adult swims, how many, you know, there's just a raft of assumptions in terms of how many units, how many widgets are we going to sell? Um, so that is, is challenging. And, and one of the things that, that, that managers are going to have to do in, in the return to business is make assumptions regarding how many members and how many casuals will return to the facility. Now, uh, I might just get you to move on to the next slide, please, RJ. Thank you. Sorry, now, sorry about the formatting. It must be because I okay. ported it into my PowerPoint. Apologies. That's okay. I think we can get the the, the gist the gist of it from from that. So, when when making some of those assumptions without without being prescriptive in terms of a percent downturn, uh, you know, some of the the um, data that I have have looked at and considered is um, what what has been the impact on gyms. So this excuse me, this um, slide is as a a few weeks old. I think it was taken from early early April, um, and it basically shows that you know gyms and fitness centres have had a a, a a downturn of consumption per person of close to 100 percent. Not surprising, really, when you consider that, that they've basically shut. So there, there isn't anywhere to go. But I, I put it there because in comparison to other sectors, um, the, the downturn in gyms and fitness has been the largest of any sector. If you look down to the bottom of, of the graph, uh, it, it, it's a good time to be in food delivery. Um, there's been an upturn in, in, in um, consumption per person. Um, same with apps gaming and music. So just keeping that in, in mind that the, the, the largest impact uh, uh, in terms of categories has been on, on gyms and fitness. Just the next slide, please, RJ. What this slide is telling us is that discretionary spend is, has decreased. Again, it's, it's just a couple of weeks old. It's the week of the 6th to the 13th of April. Um, and you can see that when um, the coronavirus crisis hit, that discretionary spend plummeted. Um, it rose a little bit when the stimulus was, was released. Um, but I uh, understand, I was looking at a, an article this morning that it has um, started to drop back from that level that it got to, and it didn't get anywhere near back up to where it used to be. Um, it has started to, to decrease once again, um, closer towards the crisis level. So. Uh, um, the leisure industry, um, two of the key drivers for um, uh, the leisure industry are discretionary, people having discretionary spend and having leisure time. Um, so a downturn in discretionary spend certainly indicates um, that when gyms reopen, there is a risk of a, of a downturn in attendances and a risk of a, a downturn in, in membership numbers. And for those of you that managed through the global um, financial crisis, uh, what's that, about 10 or so years ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, uh, my recollection managing through that period certainly was there was, a, there was a, a downturn in discretionary spend, so people cut back on items like their Foxtel subscription, gym memberships were, were certainly hit, 
Um, it's just trying to estimate and learn to swim dropped a little bit, trying to estimate the, the downturn um, due to discretionary spend. Just the next slide, please, RJ. Now here's another lead indicator of um, you know what's what's happening out, out there in the in, in society, and of course we we all know this, but this this really just does help visualise what's happening. So um, financial distress is is rising across the country. Um, the credit risk scores uh, are changing. Uh, essentially, as people lose their jobs um, and unemployment rises, uh, financial pressures at home rise. So we've, we've essentially got, um, you know, putting these three slides together, the, the gym, gym and fitness industry has closed, has shut down completely. Uh, we've got people, uh, higher level rates of unemployment, uh, discretionary spend has decreased and there are increased um, financial pressures at home. So when we get out of the current environment, the market will be different. It will be different from one area to the next. It won't be consistently the same across the country, but there will be members that don't have a job anymore. There will be members that might have a job that they might have been stood down. Um, they can't afford to retain their membership um, and they, don't, they just don't have discretionary funds. So trying to estimate that and what the impact of that will be on everyone's budgets is 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 a uh, difficult process again i don't have the answers but trying to look at some of this data and it's been updated since you know what i've presented to try and put some logic behind your assumptions of what's happening in your local government area or your suburb or your catchment is um, a methodology that i'd be advocating towards um, um, putting some um, thinking behind why your budget is is um, downturning as much as you think it will. Uh, next slide, please, RJ. Okay, so this is the the section that I referred to earlier on on, on business plan. Um, the business plan it's clearly going to need to be revisited. And align to, um, you know, or realign to your budget. Where, where does your business plan need to change? Um, what what has happened? Um, what has happened to your competitors? Uh, do your competitors still exist? Um, are they still in business? Have they changed their business model? And when we come out of this, um, uh, what what do they look like when they come out of it? Has their business model changed? Um, your business plan should you should be thinking about what the budget looks like for the rest of this year. Clearly, I think everyone will be doing that. What that looks like in 2021 and what it looks like in 21-22 and scenario testing that budget, having a base case, maybe an optimistic case and a conservative case. Um, and then a process of, of realignment needs to occur. So um, setting new goals, um, objectives, uh, new strategies and, and timeframes for delivering those and realigning your employee targets. Um, you know, what, what a person does on, the, on the, uh, the service floor each day, how does that fit in with the new strategy? What's the new objective? Where are the revisions? So there's a, a lot of work in, in re reviewing the business plan and realigning um, the, the organisation to whatever changes are made to the business plan. And as I said before, just, just don't bot off more than you can chew to start with um, because staff will be under and, and we're all under um, um, stress at the moment um, and, um, and you don't want to overload people with, with too much of that during the, the reopening um, stage. Uh, the other factor in, in the business plan is, is your team different? Um, do you have a different um, set of, of key personnel? Um, hopefully everyone's found a way to keep their key personnel in, in place and, and re-engage with them when we get back to um, normality or a sense of a form of normality. Um, but if you have lost key personnel, what impact will that have on your organisation and, um, and, and its strategy? And, and the other thing that um, the business plan, the last point I would make is 
um, uh, has the CapEx pro program changed? So particularly applicable for those that might have centres that are owned by local government. If local government has changed its capital expenditure program, and by changed I mean um, either brought some CapEx expenditure forwards and, and delivering those projects now because centres are closed and there, there is time to do that, or um, perhaps the, the council's budgets uh, are all under review, <coughs> excuse me, and councils have deferred some capital expenditure spending from perhaps this year or even next year uh, to, to maybe 2021 or 21, 22, what impact will any deferral of capital expenditure have on your operating um, um, expenses and your budget? What impact will it have on your customer satisfaction? So budgets are uh, shifting and, and changing. So just keeping in mind uh, that relationship between the CapEx program and what impact that might have on the delivery of your, of your business plan. Next slide, please, RJ. Okay, so restarting. These are in terms of the. Oops, thank you. Um, in terms of restarting um, post the coronavirus crisis, um, items uh, that that you know will will be um, that we need to consider. Um, in the startup phase of the, the cleaning, um, it looks likely that there's going to be increased frequency and costs associated with cleaning, managing the perceptions of uh, staff, managing the perceptions of our members will be quite important and communicating how we are managing those perceptions. Clearly, there's going to be increased expenditure on hand sanitizers, gym wipes, um, gels, um, perhaps temporary physical screens. Um, how will people change their hygiene habits? Um, people have changed their hygiene habits and how will that translate into the centre? Uh, they, will, they will expect businesses to have done the same. Um, there's a lot of advice out there at the moment in terms of what, what it might look like. And I note that Fitness Australia are talking about perhaps considering disabling some gym equipment to maintain um, physical distances, um, limiting numbers and what impact will the limit of um, numbers into your group exercise studio, into your gym um, look like, how will you manage queues, um, how will you manage queues into those rooms, how will you manage queues at reception if they form, out the front door if they form, how we communicate that. So there's a, there's a little bit to think about in, in that process. Um, working from home, interestingly, before COVID-19, 47% of um, Australians had no work from home experience. And 82% of those that did uh, work from home one day a week. So clearly we've changed from that and the impact of the working from home um, situation on the long term remains to be seen. But a couple of items just to be thinking about is, uh, do you need to consider your work from home policy? Will it, will it need review? Um, will the, the fundamental shift that has occurred um, will have some impact on employee expectations? Um, do your IT systems need upgrading and have you assessed the, the, the risk to your business of, of having employees um, working from home in, in the medium to, to longer term? Are you managing those risks adequately? Uh, digital fitness, some, some centres and from what I can tell most centres have done a wonderful job and probably have pressed the fast forward button on what they might have been intending to do in the digital fitness space. Um, you know, in, in three years, they've, they've managed to do it in, in three weeks. Um, some centres have fully integrated the digital fitness offering. Um, other centres, uh, I, don't, I don't think they, they have. They're, they're, they've got an offering, but what we need to be thinking about or what those centres should be thinking about is how do those new offerings integrate in the longer term with their on-site services and, and fee structures? Um, if you're hiring out gym equipment, some centres are hiring out gym equipment. Is that a new business opportunity? Will that continue post um, reopening? How, how, does they, how do these new services um, fit in with the, 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 the old um, method of delivery? And do they replace these services or do they supplement these services? So a few questions in, in there to, to contemplate. 
Um, for the communications, it's pretty clear we'll, we'll have to communicate with our members and, and staff as to what's happening. I'd be particularly conscious of, of staff giving them enough time to um, express them, express their feelings, have them acknowledged, um, asking, let the staff ask questions and get answers from management as to what um, methods and, and actions are put in place to protect their health and safety once we reopen. And obviously giving assurances to your members and building and rebuilding confidence and, and assurance um, to the members and users that the facility is, is safe and has all the measures in place it, it needs to have. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm just wary of the time, I'm just going to, going to um, move on to the supply chain management here. So what I mentioned before in terms of supply chain um, is that there is a risk at the moment that um, some supply chains have been interrupted. Um, some uh, businesses mightn't be in business anymore. And if your supply chain comes from overseas, I'm thinking about perhaps uniforms, RFID bands, inflatable rafts, you might want to um, consider in your thinking how long the lead time is to get these items if you need them upon reopening or soon after reopening, how long do you need to get these back into your business? Um, can you source them locally? What will a restart look like? Well, here's a picture of what it might look like. Um, you know, supplies like uh, I think SK Core and there, there will be others that are supplying many, um, you know, physical screens, um, screens between treadmills, hand sanitizers, logoed uh, footprints and, and, and stickers. Northern Territory have got a, a roadmap out of um, uh, COVID into uh, the new normal. Um, so if you log online and go to that, you get a few lead indicators as to what the Northern Territory are doing. If you look at um, websites, you know, obviously clearly such as uh, Fitness Australia, IAX Ursa, um, Raw Life, AIS, uh, the Swimming Pool Magazine had some data on what uh, swimming pools might look like. Uh, there is information out there for you to digest and be aware of as to what a reopening might look like. It looks like some announcements are, are, are imminent anyway, um, but there are reference guides and, and timelines um, just to, to consider. Um, and, you know, the, the current situation just in, in finishing up, you know, clearly is not permanent. Um, it looks like restrictions will, will ease gradually. Um, for me, just um, uh, um, as, a, as a facility operator, just maintain consciousness that subsequent outbreaks might occur and you know hopefully not but in your planning um, when you think about your crisis management and your disaster management planning I, I don't think anyone would have had a global pandemic in its crisis management plan or disaster management plan um, four months ago or three months ago um, it probably does now but um, you, you should clearly be contemplating what a subsequent outbreak might um, might look like and what impact you might have once we restart. As I say, hopefully it doesn't happen, but that should be part of your of your thinking. Just, just on that, Bruce, as well. Like there was uh, there was six new cases two days ago and seventeen yesterday. So so there's been in Victoria. So there's been this little mini resurgence as people are sort of going, oh, everything's working and let's just relax. I think one of the things that industry needs to consider is, you know, as everyone downloads that app. If it becomes clear that you know people are catching it in a leisure center, um, that could be very, very detrimental um, yeah. to your business and 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 our industry and the water community. So, having you know very, very uh, strict controls in place, and you know once once restrictions are eased, that it's not it's not a it's not open season. Um, that that social physical distancing needs to be uh, implemented in a clever way, following. Following expert advice, um, because it, it we'll all end up getting shut down again if we don't get it right. It's just a little caveat there for industry to consider. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think it would be. I, I'm, in fact, we can move on to the next slide. It's essentially the the, the last bit anyway. But um, you, you're completely right. I think it would be disastrous for individual businesses and um, clearly the industry um, to reopen and then have to um, pay that back. And, and reclose again. Uh, no one wants to be in that in that situation. But um, 
in case we are, I, I just think it needs to be part of the of the planning. Um, and I'm I'm happy to um, take any questions, RJ, uh, in your hands. Thanks so much, Bruce. Um, it's it's been really uh, informative, and and obviously um, you you've taken the experience that you've had of you know the the falling without a parachute and and had it you know get a lot of action items moving in a direction quickly um, and efficiently, and then you've applied that to to uh, COVID-19 and, and what a reopening might look like. It's been really, um, it's been really beneficial uh, for me to think about and, you know, put myself back in the sort of operator shoes. Um, and yeah, if anyone's got any questions, we've got about, you know, three minutes or so. So, uh, you know, hopefully you've got a doozy there. Um, send that question through. Um, we've, we've got someone saying, do you have any suggestions for, st for working with staff who are resistant to coming back due to feeling unsafe? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I, I, my, my suggestions really would, would be around, um, again, communicating, communicating with, with the staff, giving them the chance to understand um, what, what it is that they feel unsafe ab about, what, what exactly is their concern, um, because feeling unsafe could mean one thing to one person and one thing to someone else. So understanding exactly what the staffing concerns are and then having a plan to provide assurance that you will be able to meet those concerns. Um, so it's a great question, but I think what, when, when you unpack it, there's bound to be a number of sub, subsets of concerns, um, just giving the staff the time to express how they're feeling um, um, and uh, give them the chance to be understood and then giving you the chance to, re to respond to that information. You might find that it's easier um, managed than, than not, um, or conversely, and you know, hopefully not, you might find it, it is harder to, to manage. But um, I suspect it will look something like um, in, including those measures of face masks and hand sanitizers and physical distancing, etc. Yeah, thank, thanks, thanks, Bruce. And, and maybe to build on that too, uh, Sonia. You know, we, we've sent out for feedback uh, this morning and I've just dropped it in the chat, uh, a list of, you know, 200 or so um, potential risk mitigants for, for COVID-19 contextualized to a to a uh, aquatic and leisure facility. So uh, have a read of that article, um, send us your feedback. Um, Royal Lifesaving are currently working with, um, with national government at uh, sort of advocating for our industry has been particularly well placed to implement a safe return and we've got good data good data met metrics there and fitness australia are certainly advocating as well um on, for the dry side as well so so we've got some good um some good champions um but we also need we also need your feedback as well if you can jump into that um so we've got, probably got time for about one more question um just i'll just briefly spruik the upcoming webinars next week energy efficiency we've got eco save um, literally could save your facility in the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars um, if it's a big one um, and they do energy performance guarantees so they're talking to us next week we've got craig the following week talking about the national aquatic industry workforce profile john summers uh, a time to be bold the following week and then allison dixon is the current ceo of western leisure services the week after that um, so we'd love to hear back from you guys. Um, Sonia says she can't see the link that she's referring to, but she'll, she'll have a look at our web page. Um, Bruce, just on behalf of Fitness Australia, Lifesaving Victoria, I'd just like to thank you very much for your time today and your thoughts. Um, it's been really beneficial um, to hear from you, and I'm sure we had a, a, a quite a large audience there at 125 it sort of peaked at, um, which is a lot of people right. that... Um, you know, get the benefit of your experience. Um, and I, I'd just like to thank you again and, and OTM Planning Group for, for making you available. Um, Thanks, the, work, Thanks, the recording will be available on our webpage in about 24 hours. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. Um, stay safe, everyone. Just keep maintaining your physical distancing. The last thing we want is um, is a second wave and, and then we're in this for longer than we need to be. So uh, everyone keep doing the right thing. And uh, thanks once again, Bruce. No problem. No Thanks, Sanjay. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.